So take your Bible and turn with me to the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John. The Gospel of John is, well, it's kind of like the, the Bible heaven track. You know, when you go out so many, you should always have some heaven tracks on, you know. And uh, always carry some tracks. You never know, you can just plant seeds. But the Gospel of John is kind of like the heaven track. You know, you open it up and you read and study. It's one of the easiest books in the Bible to understand. And it makes the Gospel so simple and so clear. If there's any book in the Bible that God's children ought to be familiar with, it should be the Gospel of John. Now, that's the book I was reading the night that I got saved. So it's a precious book to me. I have to admit I didn't understand it, but it's the book that I read. My father-in-law explained it to me, and I trusted Christ as my Savior. So in the Gospel of John, there's a few things I want to share with you in every chapter. We're going to study the whole book of John this morning. We'll get out about three this afternoon. But it's a good book. It's a precious book. And it's a book that I highly recommend a new believer to read and to study. But it's not just for the new believer, it's for the old believer to go back through and refresh your mind. See, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God, and without Him was not anything made that was made. And then he says there in verse 2, In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not, did not understand. You see, unbelief is the cause of your darkness. When you believe what God says, it's light. It's believing the truth. And you can't walk in the light with unbelief. They're not compatible. So God says that we're all in this world and we're all in darkness and we don't understand and we're lost and cannot find our way. So the Bible says that there was a man named John sent from God to bear witness of the light. See down there in verse 7, excuse me, verse 6. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. That's an awesome verse. That all men through him might believe. It appears that God wants everybody to see the light. But see, God does not override the will of man. God states truth and then gives you the opportunity, the freedom to either believe it or not believe it. So he says that he was sent to bear witness of the light, but John was not that light. In verse 9, that was the true light, talking about Christ, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born, not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. This is the new birth. When you trust Christ as your Savior, you are born into God's family. It's not because of your parents. It's not because of the church. It's not by the will of man. I want to be this or I, want, I will myself. No. It's born by the Spirit of God. As many as received him. God said that he made the world. He came into the world. And the world knew him not. And then he says in verse 14, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father full of grace and truth. Now, I want you to look there in verse 29. The next day, Jesus, John seeth Jesus, coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Now, as I read the first chapter, those are some of the highlights in this chapter to me. That Jesus Christ was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God, 
the Word made the world and everything therein, and the Word came into the world, and the world knew Him not. And when you see the Word that tabernacled among us, God in a body form. And when John the Baptist saw Him, he says, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. So that everybody in the world can have the free gift of eternal life. Chapter 2. In chapter 2, I want you to notice that Jesus got a little upset with some of the people that were in the temple doing things that he didn't approve of. Because, you see, it was his temple. It was his father's temple. And it was to be a house of prayer. But he says, you made it a den of thieves. You were all about money. And that's not what God's about. God can make all the money he wants. Believe it or not, he says he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. There's been times I wanted him to sell a few cattle and give me some. But he does not lack anything. He has all that he needs. And he wants to use you and I for his honor and glory. And he says, you're not glorifying my father. You are a shame and a disgrace. And so he took a cord of, of, of ropes and he beat the money changers out of the temple. They didn't like that. And then he told them, he says, if you destroy this temple, I'll raise it up in three days. And they said, 46 years it took to build this temple. And you're going to do it in three days? But the scripture says that he was talking about his body. You destroy this body of mine, and I'll bring it back in three days. This was at the beginning of his ministry. So he told them who he was. And he was the Lamb of God. He was actually God in the flesh. And the thing that's neat, if he was who he claimed to be, he would know the minds of man. Look what it says in verse 23. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover in the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men. He knew all men. You stop and think, if this verse is true, and there's an element of light here, he knows you. He knows you. Look at the next verse. And needed not that any man should testify of men, for he knew what was in man. He knows everything about you. There isn't anything about you he doesn't know. He was God in the flesh. How would you have liked to have walked with a man that knew your thoughts for real? Knew everything about you. Knew your motives. Jesus Christ, even though he is not among us today in bodily form, he still knows everything about you and everything about me. Chapter 3. Chapter 3. There was a man named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, who came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a ruler come from God, for no man can do the miracles that thou doest except God be with him. And he says, you must be born again. You mean we got to get in our mother's womb and be born all over again? He says, unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God or enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said to thee, you must be born again. He says, Nicodemus, don't you understand these things? You've been a ruler in Israel. You should know. You should understand all this. But he didn't. So he says, if you don't understand earthly things, how am I going to explain to you heavenly things? So he used an Old Testament illustration about the serpent that was lifted up in the wilderness. And where the Lord says, if you look at this serpent, you shall be healed. And so they would simply look and live. That's all they had to do, look and live. So we're down in verse 14, if you'll look there with me. 
And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. You see, you and I have also been bitten by the serpent, and we are going to die. We've got a virus. It's deadly. But he says there's only one cure. As you listen today, you'll hear all kinds of people trying to explain why a guy can go into a, a movie theater and mow all those people down. Or they did it in Columbine a few years back. Or a Muslim did it down here in Texas. You see, it doesn't matter where, and a guy did it over there in Europe. You say, why do they do these things? Because they have an old sinful nature. You listen to the news and there's riots everywhere. Ethnic group against others trying to wipe out each other. People trying to kill Israel. There's people who want to bring America down. So what's the cure? White House. No. They are not the solution. They have never been the solution. You see, it's an old sinful nature and there's only one cure for that is a new one. A new nature is the only cure for an old nature. And you can have all the gun control laws you want to, and then you'll be a prisoner, and that's where we're headed. They want to take away all of our rights, all of our freedom. You say, why should I keep my guns? So that you can defend yourself against our government. Against our government. Because that's why... Our founding father says for there to be even state militia so that every man would be able to defend their state against a federal government and might even have to defend it against a state government because there's people who don't like you having your freedom. And they're not going to take your freedoms away from the people in this country as long as you've got all the people in the military that served and over the years that know how to use a gun. I believe, personally... Our government needs to fear the people, not the people fear the government. That's why it's so important, yes, we should elect good people to protect our country and our rights and liberties and so on. You say, well, who would you vote for? <clears throat> I'm glad you asked. I've had people say, well, I would not vote for no Mormon. Well, let me just mention this to you. We just got on an airplane and flew all the way up there to Chicago and back. I have no clue what the man's name was that flew the plane or his religious background. I was interested only in one thing. Can he fly the plane? Can he get this plane from here to there safely? I'm not electing the pastor of this church I'm trying to find the best man that can lead the country. And if I've only got two choices, I want to find out which one the devil is for and then vote for the other guy. And I believe there's one of them that will preserve our freedoms a little longer than the other one will. I believe there's a man right now doing everything in his power to take away our freedoms in this country. You say, I don't believe that. You're wrong. You're wrong. Our Freedoms are at stake in this country. And if I don't say what I say, it won't be long. We won't have a church. We won't have a church. We won't have our freedoms. Anyway, before I get sidetracked, I want you to look in John 3.16. For God so loved the world. See, I can love everybody in the world. I don't have to love their philosophies, their religions. They'll say, don't you have respect for other people's religious belief? No. None. If I believe I have the truth, I have to believe they have the air. If I don't believe that I have the truth, then I ought to give this up and go find what they got. But I believe that I've got the truth, and I've lived according for 52 years, and I'm not about to change. Don't send me any emails. <clears throat> Don't write me a letter. Don't call me. I'm trying to straighten me out on any of my theology. My theology is in concrete. It's not going to be moved or changed. 
If I was going to do, do that, I should have done it 50 years ago. But I like where I am. I like what I believe. I believe I know what the book says. I know what the Constitution says. And I'm set in my ways. I'm an old fogey. I'm old-fashioned. Some people even consider me to be a little bigoted. Prejudice. Hard nose. They just don't know how graceful I am. But in John 3.16, a wonderful verse. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. <clears throat> Isn't that a wonderful verse? And in spite of all the problems there are in the world, <clears throat> they're not going to be sobbed by the politicians, but by godly people. I believe that God will preserve this country if there's enough godly people in this country that look to him. And God can work out a lot of things, but there is a responsibility that God's placed upon us. So I do believe that, yes, we ought to go to the polls. We ought to vote and vote for the person that can preserve our freedoms the longest. Until the next time, then we get somebody else. And then the next time, somebody young. But just to stay home and do nothing and not vote, I don't think is a wise thing to do. Now, chapter 4. Chapter 4, Jesus says, I must needs go through Samaria. Because there was a woman there. A woman. A woman that had five husbands. And was living with a man that wasn't her husband. Now, would you talk to somebody like that? Woo! She's contaminated. She's evil. Ungodly. Woo! Jesus said, I got to go by and see her. The disciples, they had already gone to McDonald's and got him a hamburger. He said, I have meat to eat that you know not of. I got something that satisfies and feeds my soul. That's different. So in verse 4, if you look there, excuse me, verse 10, he said, Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given the living water. If you knew who I was, you would have asked me, and I would have given it. I got something that you don't have. I got some living water. It's free. He says, you drink the water that's in this well, you're going to get thirsty again and have to get some more. That's what the religions of the world are. You got some today, you better be good tomorrow. And then when you are good that day, you better be good the next day too. And you better be good the next day. See, it all depends on how good you are. But when you talk about Christianity, all I have to do is one drink from his well, springing up into a life everlasting. See there in verse 14, but whosoever, anybody, drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. You see, when I got saved 52 years ago, I've never had to get saved again. You know why I don't have to get saved again? Because I have never got lost after I got saved. I can't get lost. That's why I'll never thirst again. One drink 52 years ago in a little old living room, God satisfied my thirst. He quenched my thirst. I was satisfied. And I've always been satisfied ever since. I never have to get saved again. Oh, I have thirsted for righteousness and doing the things that God wants me to do, but never salvation. Salvation, you only get saved one time. And once you believe it, you have as a free gift everlasting life. And God said that he would do this for us. Chapter 5. Look in chapter 5, verse 24. Verse 24 says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word... And believeth on him that sent me, hath, present tense, right now, hath, what? Everlasting life. And he says, If he that believeth in me hath everlasting life, and shall not, in the future, come into condemnation. It means I can never be condemned again. But in God's eyes, I've already passed from death. To life. 
Like I've already died and was buried. It came back from the dead and I'm alive forevermore. That's how secure I am. Not because I did anything, but Jesus did it all and he put it to my account as though I did that. See, I died and paid for my sins. And I was buried. I was crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, the life that I live now, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So as a child of God, should I walk in newness of life? Yes, I should. But see, this is what the Lord had promised to us. That he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life right now and shall not in the future ever come into condemnation. There is no condemnation to those that are in Christ because, see, Christ delivered you from the curse of the law. You are dead as far as the law. The law cannot condemn you. you say, but what about all those sins that I've done? What about all the ones you're going to do? You'll never be condemned. Now, as your heavenly Father may chasten you, but you'll never be condemned. You'll never perish. Or John 3, 16 wouldn't be true. I think it's an awesome statement. Chapter 6. Chapter 6. If you will, there's a couple verses here that are very important to me. These are some of my favorite verses in every chapter. I hope they'll mean something to you. You see, favorite verses in certain places help you to remember the chapter. It helps you to remember what's inside that story. Find a verse that really means a lot to you, and it'll tell you a lot about the whole chapter. But now notice what he says in verse 37. John chapter 6, verse 37. These are familiar verses to most of us. But you know, every once in a while we have people who come into our church they just trusted Christ as Savior we have sometimes somebody that's visiting or maybe watching on the internet should we just always give some gristle to those people that are mature or should we ever once in a while also consider the weaker brother the babe in Christ you think we should give them something too or do you think it uh, doesn't hurt for senior citizens to uh, in the Lord that is to have a refresher course. You know, all these scriptures at one time, they used to taste so good to you. They used to be so precious to you. And most of you probably have already underlined them in the Bible. They're still just as good and precious to somebody who's never heard them before. And some people, it stirs them and it warms their heart. And it gives them great security and a peace of mind. Look what he says in verse 37. And all that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. I will in no wise cast out. You see, when you trusted Christ as your Savior, God gave you eternal life, and he will never, for any reason, ever cast you out. I've had people say, yeah, uh, he won't cast you out until you sin again. It doesn't say that. Why would you want to add to what God's Word said? God's Word doesn't say that. He says, in no wise, for no reason, ever cast you out. Now, if you add something on that, you just gave a reason for casting you out. But what did he say? No way he will ever cast you out. No wise. There's not a reason why God will ever cast you out. See, I can't be condemned. Christ died and paid for all of my sins. I'm going to heaven on what he did. Look in verse 39. Verse 39 says, And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me I should lose nothing. See, he'll never cast you out, and he'll never lose you. So if he'll never cast me out and he'll never lose me, I must be good to go. I'm going to heaven because I have his word. You see, the day I trusted Christ as my Savior... I was good to go that day, that moment. Nothing that I do after that can ever change that. You say, what if you do a lot of bad things? Nothing that I do after that can ever change this. I can never be condemned in the future. I can never be cast out. He will never lose me. You see, that's why I sometimes use the illustration, you know, here's the Lord and here's me. Like most people, I thought that I had to get a good grip on God. 
and hang on to the Lord and be good. And if I hang on till the day I die, I'll go to heaven. But if I don't, then I'm going to lose my salvation. Now I'm going to hell. Got to get saved again. <laughs> Got to get saved. So now I'm going to heaven. Now I'm going to hell. And that changes throughout my life. Well, my going to heaven didn't depend on, not him, depends on me. Am I strong enough? Am I good enough? Do I have the strength to carry on? No, that's not, that's not the Bible. That's religions. True Christianity is, I trust him, he saves me. You see, now it has nothing to do with me. My going to heaven depends on him. And he's, he said he'll never cast me out for any reason. He said he'll never lose me. I'm trusting him to take me to heaven. So my going to heaven, see, depends upon him, not me. And when you're trusting in your own works, then you can lose your salvation. So there's a lot of preachers out there, a lot of people that believe they can lose their salvation. That's because they're trying to save themselves. If you trust Christ as your Savior, you can never be lost again. Because he'll never cast you out. He'll never lose you. He gives you eternal life. Boy, that is some good news. Look in verse 47. Verse 47 says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. He that believeth on me hath, present tense, right now, hath what? So if you believe it, you should have everlasting life. Well, when would you have it? Right now. Hath means present tense. Right now. You will have it. If you believe it right now, if you believe that when Christ died, he died for you, and you will accept that death payment he made on the cross as yours, as your death, that he died for all of your sin, then that payment put to your account, you don't have any sins to pay for. Christ died for all of your sins, so I don't have any sins to pay for. I couldn't go to hell if I tried. I haven't tried. But I can't go to hell. I can't go today. I can't go tomorrow. I've had people tell me to go to hell, but I can't go to hell. I'd like to tell some other people what to do. Not really, not to go there. Chapter 7. Look at verse 37. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the Scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. In other words, it lasts forever. There's a fountain inside of you. There's like a river inside of you. And then in verse 39, But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because Christ had not yet been glorified. He hadn't made the payment for sin, come back from the dead, and the Holy Spirit had not yet been given. He says, but when I leave, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. And he's going to send the Holy Spirit to everyone that believes. You don't pray for the Holy Spirit. You don't beg for the Holy Spirit. You don't get down and whine and pine and moan and groan and forsake or bake and turn to burn. You don't do nothing like that. All you do is believe. So 52 years ago when I believed that Christ did it for me, the Holy Spirit indwells me that very moment. And I have been sealed until the day of redemption, until the day I leave this body. I'm going to give me a new one. So there's no way that I can be unsealed because it's from the time that I believe till the time I get my new body. It's a done deal. That's why I can't go to hell today, tomorrow, never. Do you realize the peace of mind that that is? You say, you don't deserve that. How do you know? I mean, no, no, I don't. I don't deserve it. But I'm going to heaven because God loves me that much. But God loves you the same way. And all you have to do to go to heaven is believe it. And then once you trust Christ as Savior, you never have to doubt again. Because he'll never cast you out. He'll never lose you. Greatest news in the world. Chapter 8. Look in verse 12. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. I'm the light of the world. And when he got ready to leave, he says, Ye are the light of the world. I like that. I'm the light of the world. 
You see, this is why God even took his people, because of their rebellion, scattered the nation of Israel all over the earth. Every nation. Wouldn't it have been neat if all those individual Jewish people that were scattered all over the face of the earth had been little lights? What they could have done. Do you realize that there's times in your life that God may uproot you? And send you here or there or wherever because God wants you to be a light wherever you go. And there are certain places that are dark. And God needs you here. There may be a place of business that, man, they are as wicked as wicked can be. You say, well, I don't want to go there. That might be exactly where God places you with all those heathen to shine for him. You see, God doesn't need everybody to all be in the same spot. God wants us in the world. That's why we have to, by radio or the internet, or however we, we've got to get to the world. Well, the light doesn't do any good. We could all sit here and say, let my little light shine. To who? I got one too. You got one too. We already see the light for shining is because there's a lot of people still in darkness. And God wants to use us. Chapter 9. Look there in verse 25. In verse 25, there was, had been a story of a blind man. He could not see. And these stories are written in the Gospel of John so that we might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And that by believing you may have life through his name. And so it tells a story about a man that was blind, and he was made to see. And so he says in verse 25, he answered and said, Whether Christ, talking about Christ, is a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I know, that whereas I was blind, now I see. For 18 years of my life, all I know is I was blind. And my father-in-law led me to Christ, and now I see. I love that song in Amazing Grace. I once was blind, but now I see. I was blind, now I see. You see, I know how to go to heaven. I'm not lost anymore. You see, if you don't know for sure you're going to heaven when you die, you're lost. You're lost. You're still in darkness. All you got to do is believe what Jesus said. Believe the truth. And when you believe the truth, you have the light, the way to go to heaven. It's a free gift, and it's all we have to do. Look here in chapter 10. In chapter 10, I want you to look at this one verse, verse 28. What a verse. And I give unto them temporary life. I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish unless they sin again. See, you can add anything that you want, but it's not in the Bible. He says, and they shall never perish. That means in the future, male or female, or neuter, if you don't know which one you are. Anywhere, anytime, any place, time and eternity, never perish. Can never go to hell. And that's why he says, and neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Look up here. I am in his hand. Nobody, you or anybody else, no man can pluck you out of his hand. Why? See, I'm trusting him to take me to heaven. So my going to heaven depends upon him keeping his word. You see, most people say, well, you've got to live like it. Live like what? You say, you're trying to tell me you can live like the devil and still go to heaven? That's exactly what I'm telling you. Of course. So I ain't never heard no preacher say that. Well, then they haven't got the courage. I'll tell you what the Bible says. Should I, as a child of God, because I'm going to heaven, I should live like it. But how I live doesn't affect me getting there. I'm going to heaven because, see, it's free. It's the gift of God. And that's... Some mighty, mighty good news. Look in chapter 11. Chapter 11. There's the story about Lazarus. You see, the story about Lazarus, God already knew 
that he had died. He said, well, then let's go to the funeral. He says, Master, it's been four days. He stinks. He says, I'm glad he's dead. He said, well, it doesn't say that. But look at verse 15. Lazarus is dead in verse 15, 14. And I'm glad. That's what he said. Lazarus is dead. And I am glad for your sake. I'm fixing to give you an object lesson. You see, I can tell you I am the resurrection and the life and that everybody's going to come out of the graves. Uh, that's mentioned in chapter 5 also. About the great resurrection. He says, let me show you something. He said, this ought to knock your socks off. Let's go. Of course, Mary and Martha met him in just a boo-hooing. If you'd have been here, this wouldn't have happened. Because they knew he could have stopped that. Isn't that how we are? Lord, if you know who I am and you know where I am and if you really love me, why did you let this bad thing happen to me? Do you know who I am? <laughs> I was at the rest. <laughs> I forgot where I was. It might have been in line. I was, I was playing around again. Every once in a while I get in a silly mood. And I says, do you know who I am? I says, ma'am, do you know who I am? <laughs> I said, the lady, she called security guard, says, come down here quickly. There's a man down here who don't know who he is. <laughs> so. But anyway, here we are in the Gospel of John in verse 25. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. You believe all of this? She said, yeah, the Lord, I believe that. I know that's true. He says, but do you believe that I can do it now? I mean, if I am, I can, I can do it now. I am. President, I am. This is who I am. I'm the resurrection. I'm the life. In verse 27, she said unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which cometh into the world. And when she had so said, she went her way, called Mary. And then a little bit later, he says, Lazarus, come forth. Probably hadn't called him by name. Everybody in the whole cemetery would have got up. Lazarus come forth. And a dead man comes to life. Would you be afraid of serving someone who has the power to bring you back from the dead if somebody took your life? I still don't want to die. I said, I've never done it before. I don't want to hurt. I don't know what that last moment would be like. It scares me to death. Think about it. But every one of us are going to die one day. But see, all of our faith and confidence is in someone who came back from the dead, can give life. And that's why he says, if you believe in me, you shall never die. And though you die, yet shall you live. You see, when I was born into the world, flesh, I trusted Christ, spirit. If a man believe in me, he'll never die. That's the second birth. But though he die, this one, yet shall he live. Makes it so much easier. Chapter 8. Excuse me, chapter 12. As you go through life and you realize who he is and what he's done for you. And you know the only hope for the world is that they put their trust in Christ. I remember preaching in the Miami Rescue Mission down in Florida. 1966, I believe it was. And there was a little sign up there on the podium that says... Sirs, we would see Christ. We would see him. And I thought the whole time I was preaching, they need to see him. They need to see him. And whatever it is that I preach on, I got to make sure that these winos from off the street, they, they've got to see him. There is no hope without him. They have to see him. So he says in verse 21, The same came therefore to Philip, which said of Bethsaida, of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sirs, we would see Jesus. We would see Jesus. Now, in the same chapter, in verse 32, he says, And I, if I be lifted up, will draw all men unto me. So if I can get people to see Jesus because I lift him up in my messages, because I honor him, and I glorify him, I expect, people to look to Christ. I expect people to believe on Jesus Christ. 
When I witness to people, I expect people to trust them because the, 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 the message is so glorious, it's hard for me to believe that anybody would turn it down. Oh, there's a few that do. But there's also people that say, that, that makes sense to me. I've never heard it like that before. They've heard about religion and all about the things they have to do, but they've never heard about what's been done. And it's the most important thing in all the world. Christ did that for us. Look there in chapter 13. Chapter 13. And look there in verse 13. Chapter 13, verse 13, where he says, Ye call me Master and Lord, and ye say, Well, for so I am. If he is the Lord, and he is the Master, and we've already believed, and we've trusted him as our Savior, and we want people to see the Lord, high and lifted up. If he is the Lord, shouldn't he be Lord over me? You see, shouldn't I yield to the Master? And look at the verse that he says here that's so important. <clears throat> look in verse 17. If you know these things, that the Lord, he's, he's in charge, he's the boss. As a child of God, if I will allow him to be master over me because of my yielding to him. He says, if you do these things, happy are ye. I have wanted to be happy all my life. There's a lot of people who want to be happy. They're not happy. They're always sad, always down, always whining and complaining. Instead of being happy and joyful in the Lord. Happy are ye. You want to be happy? Cast your cares upon the Lord. Walk with the Lord. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Sounds good to me. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. But see, nobody, and even God, he will not make you trust him as Savior, and he will not make you yield to him. He'll only make you wish you had of. You ever told your kids that? What he says. Chapter 14. Chapter 14, he says, you believe in God, believe also in me. He says, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you so. But he said, I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, there you may come also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. <laughs> and somebody had a problem. Thomas said unto him in verse 5, We know not whether thou goest. How can we know the way? He says, I am the way. I'm the way. Somebody said, how did you get to Chicago? We went by plane. That was the way. The way we got there was the plane. How do we get to heaven? By Christ. You see, he's the only way to get there. You reject Christ, you can't go. There is no other way. There's no option. There's no plan B. He is it. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. I think that's a wonderful thing to know. Chapter 15. You see, as you go through here, you'll notice that all of this builds. It builds. From one truth to another truth to another truth to another truth. What's the one thing that God wants us to do when we yield ourselves to the Lord? When we do that. And we explain to people the way to get to heaven. Well, look what he says there in verse 8. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear forth much fruit. It's about the fruit bearing. You see, it's because when we lift him up, because that's what people need to see. But that's because somebody has yielded to the will of God to be used. And as we yield ourselves to the Lord, then God's going to give you fruit. Because you lift him up high. It will work God's way. Chapter 16. Chapter 16, look in verse 13. Did you know that as you seek to do what God wants you to do with your life, God says you're going to have the Holy Spirit living within you. And any man who desires to do the will of God shall know the will of God. 
You see, God knows whether you will do the will of God, even if you knew the will of God. So he says in verse 13, How be it when he, the Spirit of truth, is come. You ought to underline this. He will guide you into all truth. All truth. If there's anything you want to know and need to know to do the will of God, it's the truth of the Word of God. And the author of the Scriptures live within you to teach you. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear and what he shall speak, and he will show you things to come. As you'll find out even in the book of Revelation, that was things to come. But you see, there is a reason why God does what he does and how he explains all of his stuff in his word. Look in John chapter 17. When he talks about prayer, the Lord's prayer, this is the Lord's prayer. This is where Jesus himself prays for you and prays for me. I think it's awesome. Because as you seek to do the will of God, you have the Holy Spirit living within you that maketh intercessions for you, who understands you, understands the work that has to be done, knows what strength you need, and knows that you need to pray and talk to your Heavenly Father. So God gives us in chapter 17 the perfect example of how to pray for yourself and for others. But look what he says there in, I'll get there in just a minute. Look what he says in verse 1. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. This is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. You see, there's things that God wants you to know. See, God wants you to walk with the Lord and talk to the Lord, and He wants you to get as close to your Heavenly Father as you can get. And God will give you so much more knowledge that you never knew existed. And he will, it will burn inside of you. God is good. Chapter 18. Chapter 18, look in verse 36. In verse 36, He says, Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. I'll read that and I'll just stop and think. My kingdom is not of this world. Though he has a kingdom here. He has an army here. And he is the king. But we know that when he comes to the earth and sets up his kingdom upon the earth, the one that he promised to King David and the nation of Israel, that day is coming. And he'll rule upon the earth for 1,000 years. But right now, I simply want to, as a child of God, I am in the kingdom of God. His kingdom is not of this world. You see, our world and our fight right now is not with guns and bullets and hand grenades and things like that. We may use some of those in order to protect ourselves and our kingdom, but we're not here to conquer the world except through the message. That's why he says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every nation. Because God wants everybody in the world, but we win our battles, our spiritual battles, by depending upon the truth of the Word of God to conquer the minds of individuals. We don't use force upon people who don't believe. Now, as a nation, we have nothing wrong in defending our freedoms that we have, or our families and our kids, children and our grandkids. Uh, that's Remember, don't get mixed up. There's some people that are so pacifist, oh, I won't defend myself and so forth. And the guy comes to the door and he wants to rape his wife and kill his children. Well, come right in. Can I help you in any way? Uh, no, no, no. I know you're intense. I'm blasting you with a 12-grade shotgun right between the eyes. Like this old Quaker said one time, he says, I meaneth thee no harm, but thou standest right where I'm about to shoot. Chapter 19. Chapter 19, look there in verse 30. Verse 30, Jesus is on the cross. He didn't said a lot of things. And then makes the statement in verse 30, When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he says, and you ought to underline these words in your Bible, It is finished. 
it is finished. Those are three powerful words. The payment for our sins were paid for on the cross. Not when he was buried, and not when he came back from the dead. He died on the cross and shed his blood to make the payment necessary for our sins. He gave up his life, and then he says, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Chapter 20. Look what he says in verse 30. Chapter 20. And many other signs. Truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written. That you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And that believing you might have life through his name. Why was this book written? So that you would believe on Jesus Christ. So that you could know that you have eternal life. Simply by believing on him. He says that's why he said it. See there's nothing for you to do. It is finished. The work is done. All that you and I have to do. It's the only thing we can do. Is accept that work that he did for us. I don't have to work for God. I don't have to do any good works to go to heaven. Christ did it for me. And he died on that cross and paid for all of my sins. So that I could have as a free gift everlasting life chapter 21 in verse 5 he says Jesus said unto them children have you any meat see they gone fishing because they were down and discouraged and things weren't looking too bright you know Jesus has been crucified they were having a pity party James, Peter said I'm going fishing everybody else said I'm going with you so they toil all night. And what did they catch? Nothing. See, there's nothing in this world that satisfies once you know the truth. Once you know the will of God for your life, it's a devastating thing to an individual, an emptiness, to try to find some meaning in life when you have rejected the true meaning of life. He says, have you, have you any meat? Says, no. So he... Um, says in verse 6, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. They cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of the fish. That's not fair. I've been fishing. I've even been with Dr. Vincent Sizemore. And we fish on this side of the boat, and then we fish on that side of the boat. I said, Lord, there ain't no other side of this boat. Where's the fish? Did you know that when they were catching all these fish and the net's about to break and dragging it, uh, Jesus is on the beach. He already had some. So he says there in verse 12, Jesus said to them, come and dine. Come and dine. You see, once you've trusted Christ as your Savior and you know the will of God for your life, don't forget, you need to come and dine with the Lord. Spend time with God. He ought to be the most precious thing to you in, in all, this, this, all this world. But do you ever dine with him? Do you let him feed your soul? Or you just talk to God when you need something? Use him like as a, you know, a backup. You know, I, Lord, I got this plan, but you're in my backup plan. When I need you, I'll call you. All right, you stay there, right there. I don't think you get it right. Look up here. This sin represents you and me, and the wallet represents sin. We all have sin on us. All of us do things wrong. We are all in darkness. We've all gone our own way. There's none righteous, no, not one. And God says because we committed the sin, we have to pay for it, and it's death and hell. But God loves us. He wants us to go to heaven. Go to heaven, you have to be perfect. You've got to be righteous as God, and none of us are. We've all come short of God's perfection. And God says you cannot save yourself. So that's why... And this book was written. That we would understand that God hath made this same Jesus Christ Lord over all. And he sent his son into the world. There was a man named John who came to bear witness of the light. That means he, he came to tell you about Jesus. 
This is the light that lighteth every man that comes in the world. Man can't get no light from nowhere else. He is the only light. He's the only truth. You reject Christ, you can't have light. You'll never have understanding. So Christ came into the world because he loved us, hates our sin because it separates us from him. Christ took the sin, paid for it on the cross, came back from the dead and said, if you believe he did it for you, he would give you as a free gift, everlasting life. You get to go to heaven on what Christ did for you. If you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, why not do it right now? Let's pray, shall we? Every head bowed and every eye closed. If you're here tonight or this morning or listening by internet, if you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, you've heard about it maybe, but you just never did, would you trust Him right now? God said if you would trust Him right now, He will save you right now. He that believeth on me hath, present tense, hath, right now, hath everlasting life. Do you believe that? Will you believe it? With heads bowed and eyes closed, I'm going to ask you if you will raise your hand. I'm not going to have you forward. I'm not going to embarrass you, but right where you're sitting. You said, Preacher, that made sense to me. And right now, the best I know how, I will trust Christ as my Savior. And I'd like for you to pray for me. Would you slip your hand up very quickly and put it right back down? Anyone at all? Yes, God bless you, sir. God bless you. I, yes, I see your hand in the back. You can put it down. Anyone else? Just very quickly, just slip it up and say, that made sense to me. See, once you trust Christ as your Savior, God gives you eternal life. If it's eternal life, well, it lasts forever. If it lasts forever and all your sins are paid, then where would you go when you die? You get to go to heaven. And you can know that you're going to heaven when you get up to leave this, this morning. Anyone else before we close? Our Father, we thank you so much. Lord, it's a precious thing when we see individuals accept Christ as their Savior. We know that by doing so, they become your child, your child forever, that you'll never cast them out and never lose them. We ask, Lord, that they would get a Bible and read and study it so that they can become strong, that you talk to them and help us to be a blessing to them. And also, Father, bless each person for